Hi everyone, and welcome back to the St. Paul Center's Quarantined Catholic Hub. My name is Curtis Mitch, and today we're going to reflect on today's Mass readings, today April 30th. And instead of looking at the Gospel today, I'm actually going to devote our attention to the first reading that the Church gives us today, and that's from the book of Acts, the book of Acts chapter 8, verses 26 to 40. This is not only a charming story that I happen to like personally, it's also a story that touches upon a number of themes that are very important to us here at the St. Paul Center. All right, so I'd like to take a few minutes to kind of set the scene and we can meet the characters and then we can ask the question, you know, what is God trying to teach us today? So we begin in verse 26 of Acts 8. It says, An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, who is this, this figure Philip? He's actually a very important person in the ancient church, in the earliest days of the church in Jerusalem, in Judea, in the land of Israel. Philip is a missionary evangelist, and he's been going around Judea proclaiming the gospel, winning converts, but in addition to, to just preaching, he's healing the sick and he's driving out demons. So he's a healer, an exorcist, and God is exercising great power through this man, Philip. But even more than that, if we were reading uh, sequentially through the book of Acts, we would have learned in Acts chapter 6 that Philip is one of the seven deacons of the early church. He's one of the seven men that were ordained by the apostles to assist them in their ministry so that they were free to do what God had called them to do. And the church has always understood these first seven ministers who were ordained by the laying on of hands by the apostles as the first deacons of the church. So Philip is an ordained minister of the church. He's part of the clergy of the church. He's also obviously a married man at this point because he has four daughters, and they're four extraordinary daughters. We learn later on in the book of Acts that Philip the evangelist is the father of four daughters who were unmarried, all of whom were prophesying. They were prophetesses in the earliest church. So Philip is an important person, and he's here on the scene. He's going to proclaim the word of God on the one hand, and on the other, he's going to administer the sacraments. We will see him baptize this person that he encounters on the road. And he's on the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. This road is moving southwest. It's leaving the land of Israel. It juts across the northern part of the Sinai Peninsula and goes into Egypt and Africa from there. And we'll see why that's important. This is a desert road, says St. Luke, the author of Acts. And Philip rose and went, and behold, an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a minister of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem to worship. So this is the second character in our story. He's not given a name, but he's identified in several ways. One, he's an Ethiopian, okay? This is a man who has come to Israel from Africa, all right, all the way to Africa. He's a eunuch, which probably means that he was castrated, okay? Royal court officials in antiquity who had the role of being a eunuch were oftentimes castrated. We'll see why that's important as well. And he was a minister of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. He was a royal court official, some sort of uh, a financier or finance minister for this queen in this Ethiopian kingdom. But the curious thing is that he was in Jerusalem to worship, which means that the Ethiopian was probably something like, he would fall into the category of somebody who was a diaspora Jew. Okay, you have Jews that lived in the land of Israel, in the homeland, but Jews who lived away from the land of Israel lived in what's called the diaspora or the dispersion. Okay, and, and this youth, uh, Ethiopian eunuch really falls into that category. So in some sense, he appears to be committed to, dedicated to the God of Israel, and yet because he's a eunuch, he was probably not a full proselyte meaning he was probably not, he wasn't able to convert fully 
to Judaism because being castrated, he couldn't be circumcised. So he couldn't be incorporated into the Abrahamic covenant in a complete way. All right. But nevertheless, he was a worshiper of the God of Israel, and he had come a great distance to worship the Lord in his temple in Jerusalem. And then finally, what we learn is that this Ethiopian who is traveling back from Jerusalem, so he's going to, he's jutting down this road that's, that's going to cut across the northern part of the Sinai Peninsula. He's headed back to Africa. And what is he doing on his travel? He's reading scripture. All right. So in verse 28, we get, he was returning seated in his chariot and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? All right, two things. First, it's important to point out, this is just a little side note at no extra cost to you, is um, the fact that in antiquity, almost all reading was done out loud, okay? So there's a famous story of the Roman statesman and orator Cicero who complained in a letter to his friend Atticus that he couldn't read on a particular day. And why? Because he had a sore throat. Now for you and I, there's no connection between those two things, all right? But in the ancient world, reading was done not only with the eyes, but with the ears. You always read out loud. And that's why Philip, who can come up to him, can hear him reading the scripture in his chariot. So F Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you are reading? And he said, and this is really important, how can I unless someone guides me? So here's a man who's dedicated to the God of Israel. He has come to worship in the house of the God of Israel, but he's struggling to understand the scriptures that were inspired by the God of Israel. And so he acknowledges that he needs help. And Philip, and Philip gives him this help. Philip, who is an ordained member of the church, he is a clergy member who has been ordained by the apostles, has been anointed with the Spirit to help him understand what he needs to understand. And he invited Philip to come and to sit with him. And now the passage of the scripture which he was reading was this, okay? And this is a really important excerpt from the book of Isaiah. It appears in the Isaiah chapter 53, okay? It reads, As a sheep led to the slaughter, or a lamb before its shears is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life is taken up from the earth. Now, this is a really mysterious and puzzling portion of scripture. Okay, Isaiah 53 is actually what is known as the fourth servant song. All right, there are at least four songs in the latter chapters of Isaiah, beginning in Isaiah 42 and extending to Isaiah 53. There are four songs about a mysterious figure called the servant of the Lord. And there's a question. He's a mysterious figure because the servant of the Lord is, on the one hand, closely identified with Israel, and yet he is clearly distinguished from Israel. Okay, and so there's a connection there, but it's not entirely clear what that connection is. But it turns out that as you get as you read through the four servant songs and you get to the fourth and climactic one, which is the one the Ethiopian is reading from here in Isaiah 53, this, it turns out that this mysterious figure of the servant ends up being a tragic figure, all right? He is rejected by his own generation, but he's not just rejected, he's despised by his own generation. And he's not just rejected and despised by his generation, he is ultimately abused and killed by his own generation. That's why we say this mysterious figure is a tragic figure. But in early Christianity, the identity of the servant became crystal clear in light of the events of Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection. That the mysterious figure of the servant 
who is a tragic figure, who is rejected, despised, and killed by his own people, ends up being a messianic figure. All right, It becomes crystal clear to the early church that this is a passage about the Messiah. The servant who suffers at the hands of his own people is none other than Jesus the Messiah. All right? He is the lamb who was spoken about by the prophet Isaiah centuries before the rise of Christianity. And he's not just any lamb, like a, a, a lamb out in the pasture. He's a sacrificial lamb. Okay, this individual, the mysterious, tragic, suffering servant of the Lord, is one who offers his own life on behalf of others. He makes his life an offering for sin. It will say later on in this fourth servant song. And so this servant figure, this lamb, he's innocent, and yet he chooses to lay down his life as an offering on behalf of those who are guilty, me and you, so that by his wounds we can be healed, all right? It is no accident that it is precisely Isaiah 53 that the church reads on Good Friday because this is a prophetic preview of the passion of the Lord Jesus himself, who is the lamb slain for the sins of the world. Now, we read on. And the eunuch said to Philip, this is what Philip is explaining to him, about whom, pray, does the prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? And then Philip identifies the lamb. Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. Isaiah was talking about Jesus. And as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. Remember, this is a desert road, so there's not going to be a lot of water around, so it's going to be a significant thing when they, when they finally spot some. What is to prevent my being baptized? Okay? Nothing is to prevent it if he comes to believe in Jesus. And he commanded the chariot to stop. They both went down into the water, and Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So he becomes a convert to Christianity. All right. Now, what are the lessons that we can take away from this? There are, I think, two things that we can kind of put in our back pocket and take with us um, as we go through our day today. The first thing is this. This episode teaches that we need a guide to understand the scriptures. Okay. In order to understand scripture properly and then apply it to our lives rightly, we have to, we need help. We need a guide. We need someone who can enlighten us, and we need a guide who is like Philip, that is to say, someone who is connected with the apostles, all right? Scripture, in other words, is not something that is self-interpreting. It's something that has to be interpreted in the living context of the church, in the context of the church's living tradition. It has to be in continuity with what the apostles were teaching. Because when you think about the early church, they didn't even have a New Testament yet, okay? But what did they do? They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, all right? And Philip is an ordained minister connected by the apostles and commissioned by him to do this very thing, to spread the good news about Jesus. So that's the first thing. We do need help to understand the scriptures. We do need a church to guide us. The second thing is this. And this appears in verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. What does this tell us? It tells us that scripture is a tool for evangelization. All right? Scripture is an instrument for sharing the good news about Jesus with other people. All right? It's the, the importance of scripture in the life of the church cannot be and must not be underestimated. It's vitally important for the church's mission of helping to save the world, of calling them to faith in Jesus Christ. And, and, and what's interesting here is that Philip begins with this scripture. In other words, it's not just the New Testament that proclaims Jesus Christ. He begins with a passage from the Old Testament, because it is our conviction as Catholics that the entirety of Scripture 
Old Testament and New, is preparing the way and proclaiming the coming of God's Son to earth to be our Savior. And so beginning even with an Old Testament passage, Jesus can be proclaimed. So I hope this is helpful to, for you today. I pray that God blesses you and the rest of your day, and we will see you back here next time. Thanks.